Well, good afternoon, everyone. On this June 14th, today, we celebrate the solemnity of Corpus Christi, the mystery of the Eucharist. And I, I'm logging in to leave a spiritual message for those who can't join us in the flesh. I mentioned at the beginning of Mass that we are in, for me, the most interesting part of our liturgical calendar, where we dive into the deep waters of the great mysteries of God's own self-identity, which we would know nothing of if he hadn't revealed it to us. We began a couple weeks ago with the Feast of Pentecost, celebrating the mystery of the Eucharist, how the Eucharist desires to dwell within us and write God's law in our hearts and lead us. And then last week, the greatest mystery of all we took on, the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, and now today, the mystery of the Eucharist. These, these are deep, deep subjects, and I am sure that a million things could be said uh, about the Eucharist, but I'll try to keep my focus to three main thoughts for us to dwell on theologically. But before I do, I want to recap, I think, an important part of our celebration last week, in case you were not at one of my Masses. I brought up something of the sacraments of initiation, which of course are baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist, because we still have unfinished business here in our church since the Easter season was entirely canceled here in the state of Oregon. We are just now still receiving in small groups those who were studying and preparing to be received into the church at the Easter vigil. I think I have one more celebration to go in Spanish, but in the last several weeks we have been receiving people. So these sacraments, which we've celebrated every week now, are very much on my mind. And I mention them in regard to the Most Holy Trinity because I think they reveal something about the, the mystery of who God is from his side of the equation. Um, I shared that although the Trinity always moves together, you can never dissect one person from the others. And nevertheless, we can still look at events and mysteries and say that one person of the Trinity perhaps has stepped a little more into the spotlight than the others. And that's the case, I think, at least the way I think about the sacraments of initiation. Beginning with baptism, which is the gateway to the other sacraments, I shared that to me, that is God the Father most on display. He so desires to be intimately connected with us that he wants to adopt us into his family so that we are made his children by that sacrament with Jesus as our older brother. Then we look at confirmation where we are told that the paraclete will come and write God's law upon our hearts so that we might know God's will in our life and might have the strength and the courage to live it. The Holy Spirit literally helps us to come to know God better in the way he wants to reveal himself. And the Holy Spirit also dwells within each of us as the prophets promised in such a way that from the greatest to the least, from the youngest to the oldest, we may know God. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to have genius IQ. You just spend time in prayer and dwelling on his word and you can come to know the things of God. And then finally, the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith, where we receive Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity within ourselves. Uh, in today's gospel, Jesus reminds us if we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we will have his life within us. And we, we heard similar thoughts last week to the gospel that if we keep God's commandment, uh, Jesus the Son and God the Father will come and make their dwelling within us and that the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, will also dwell within us. So in this, we have a starting point to think of the Eucharist in that God has this amazing, intense desire, though he so far surpasses our understanding, to connect with us on a deep level, not just to drop by from time to time, not just to walk beside us or pat us on the back, but really to make his home within us. The Eucharist is that. And um, I, I added that when, you, when we consider the Eucharist in, in uh, isolation, we speak of it as the source and summit of our faith. Uh, it speaks of, of the power of this particular sacrament. I just briefly shared the story of Jacques Cousteau, 
trying to trace down the source and summit of the Amazon River. I've shared this story before, so I won't go into detail, but long story short, he found a little trickle coming out of a rock in the Andes Mountains. And that little trickle, along with tens of thousands of other tributaries, form the Amazon River. Most people consider the Nile River the bigger river because it's a few miles longer. But the Nile River, in, in a more of a desert location, has only three major tributaries. And if you consider the Amazon River in its entirety, it is certainly the greatest river on planet Earth. At its delta, I'm told, it's over 75 miles across. And thousands and thousands of species of plants and animals live along this river. It's very life-giving uh, in the jungle. And to me, it's a perfect metaphor for the church. Uh, Jacques Cousteau, by the way, marked that source and summit with a white cross. Now, just as the blood of Christ trickles down the cross uh, and th that sacrifice on the cross helps to build the church, so are we part of that little trickle. We, we're like a kitchen faucet by ourselves. If we look at our own situation, we're not, not much but a drip. But if you take the billion plus members of the Catholic Church together, we form a mighty, mighty church, and it's a church that has the power, if we were all open to receive the Eucharist in the way we are supposed to, to really transform the face of the earth. To that, I want to just add three other quick concepts, and I think we can get at the depth of the most important parts of the theology of the Eucharist. The first is that we speak of the Eucharist as a sacrament of unity. This is something I think that very often people overlook. When, it, when we say sacrament of unity, if people think of it at all, in my experience, they are thinking of being united with God, which they should, but that is only half the equation. We, you know, that's the vertical beam of the cross, and certainly we are united with God in the most intimate way when we receive that sacrament, but what we sometimes overlook is that horizontal beam of the cross that not only are we united with God in that moment, we are united with each other in a special way. Though we're not blood relatives, though we come from various different walks of life, uh, different cultures, different languages, different races, different socioeconomic status, in that moment, when we share the Eucharist as a community, we share a common blood. We are one. Now, this is something close to my heart because I attended... Uh, Mount Angel Seminary. I think Mount Angel Seminary in the West was one of the first seminaries to select an overarching theological theme to its entire curriculum that drives everything else from liturgy to uh, various subjects of theology. That theme for us is Eucharistic Ecclesiology. It's a fancy term that you don't really need to know except to understand that by it we mean that the Eucharist builds the church the Eucharist holds the church in its being. And so that concept was peppered into every single class I took at seminary. In fact, the seminary itself, if you know local history, is built on a hill called Tamalapaho. Even for the native people before Christianity arrived, uh, the literal translation of that place is Hill of Communion. It was always a sacred place of communion for tribes to come together to seal agreements, to trade, and especially it was a sacred place. So it was a place of worship. Uh, when the monastery was built there nearly two centuries ago, it continued that theme of communion. And uh, because of that, I had a great uh, experience of shock when I took on a new ministry in seminary while I was there. I was a prison minister for three and a half years. So I worked in four different states in high security facilities and uh, the, the contrasting experience of liturgy in those places compared to how I had experienced them in seminary and local parishes really struck me so much so that I, I did my Master of Divinity on that subject, how to, how to worship and do liturgy in a high security setting and what the implications of that are. Um, and as I describe it to you, you may be shocked by the similarities between our current coronavirus restrictions. Um, but at the time, keep in mind, it was about 20 years ago. I had never seen anything like this. I went to the prison. The first time I went to a mass in a prison, 
And first of all, you know, it wasn't a certain thing that you could go to mass. Some people had to stay locked up due to bad behavior. So it was a right you had to earn. But if you could, then it was a very laborious thing getting people gathered out of their cell. They were instructed in the prison I was at to walk along a yellow line painted on the concrete uh, about six or 10 feet apart. So there was social distancing. And that was so that they would not be able to pass drugs or threats or information to one another in case there were those gathered who were meaning to misuse the privilege of the mass. They were instructed to sit in separate pews together at the sign of peace within the mass. They were not allowed to shake hands, etc., etc. It's what we're dealing with now. We as Americans are experiencing what 20 years ago was reserved for the most dangerous criminals in America in high security prisons. And when you see that, um, trying to understand Eucharistic ecclesiology and us coming together, being united, it's much harder to understand. But all the more important reason that I bring this up in our current setting to, to understand that we uh, share this special bond. And it's something that is not readily on display. Unfortunately, I've seen, for instance, in election years, people receiving communion and then proceeding to go outside and get into arguments with one another or people racing to get out of the parking lot rather than connecting as a community. If we really want to understand the power of the Eucharist and enter into the full grace of it, we have to not only get that we are uniting with God in that moment, but that we're forming one community, which is the body of Christ. So that's first. Second, uh, I look at the Old Testament models of sacrifice, and there are two main ones, and I point to them because they're a foreshadowing of what we celebrate in the Mass today, and they're both folded into it, and they're contained within it. Um, first of all, if you read about sacrifices of the harvest, there was the concept of a sacrifice of thanksgiving. This was a a built-in protection, I think, a, a, a great wisdom to guard against materialism and to remind people that all good things come from God. So they were told that before you take your crops or your herds to market to make your income, you must first take the very best of them and give them to God. Yes, that involves sacrifice. But it was meant to be a constant reminder that we cannot succeed at all if God is not blessing our efforts and helping them to bear fruit. Um, the prophets go on to say um, in multiple places that the sacrifice I desire is that of a contrite heart and that of thanksgiving. That is what the Eucharist means, if you know Greek. The Eucharist means thanksgiving. So we have that component contained in our mass but there was also a second dimension to sacrifice that was atonement for sin there were certain kind of sins that were so grievous such a harm to society and against god that um, people were were told they had to make some sacrifice to atone for it it's kind of a foreshadowing of confession a reminder that we need constantly to uh, repent and ultimately we know that the Eucharist that we celebrate today, the modern day Passover, is linked to the ultimate and perfect sacrifice of Jesus. He died on the cross at 3 p.m., which in the temple liturgy was the time of the evening sacrifice, when that male unblemished lamb was offered up for the sins of the people committed that day. Because Jesus was the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice, he didn't need to do this daily. He needed only to do it once. And today we represent that. We don't re-crucify him or re-sacrifice him, but we represent it uh, for the atonement of our sins. So in the same way, it, those who participate in the Mass need to understand that we are making a sacrifice of both thanksgiving and atonement for sin. And the last component, besides it being a sacrament of unity, an expression of thanksgiving and an atonement for sin, is that it involves a renewal of a covenant, much like the original Passover. The closest analogy we have today is marriage. I told the crowd who was with me at the noon mass uh, 
What would you think if, for those who are married if the only time your spouse ever told you they loved you was the day you got married? For us, the spiritual analogy of that would be baptism. If the only time you told your spouse I love you was then, you wouldn't have a very fruitful and healthy marriage. Uh, the best marriages are ones that constantly uh, renew that expression and, and show love and commitment for each other. And, and I've said that love in the Catholic sense is an act of the will. It's not an emotion. It's not something that changes like the weather. I make the decision and I'm the only one who has control over it. You don't have control over it. If I choose to love you, that's an act of my will. And even if you treat me poorly, it's only I who can stop loving you. In the same way, that's God's view of us. We sin all the time, but God in his act of divine will chooses to love us no matter what. His love is constant. He is love itself. But we are in a kind of a spiritual marriage with God. And it means that if we want a healthy relationship, we need to say, I love you back from time to time. We need to work on things from our end. And this is why I, I told uh, the people who are gathered today that, you know, when we celebrate First Communions, as we're starting to do now in our parish, there's a reason why young girls wear white dress that looks similar to a wedding dress and the young men wear suits. It's because when you walk down that aisle to receive the Eucharist, you are essentially saying, I do. When the priest says the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, when we say amen, we're really saying I do, or I still love you, or again today, I love you, God, I give myself to you. It's my will, my determination to stay close to you just as you are determined to stay close to me. That's power that keeps us close to him, keeps us from straying, and, uh, and last of all, I shared that in, in that sense of covenant uh, and that wedding image, there was one girl at morning mass I had yesterday making her first communion. I shared with her the experience I had in my first mass of Thanksgiving. My class was all from Oregon. And so you'd know, normally the custom is to go to your hometown and start there by giving thanks to those who helped to form you in the faith by offering a mass for them and go to all of the places that you served in your time of formation in training to celebrate masses in those locations. I'm not from here, so I asked permission to celebrate my first mass at the cathedral and Archbishop Vlasny was kind enough to allow that. My family was there gathered. Uh, and as we went out into the main body of the church and we passed through the the doorway of the sacristy, I looked up and there was a plaque with a quote from St. Teresa of Calcutta. It, it's a famous quote, many of you may have heard of it, but it said, priest of God, celebrate each mass as though it were your first mass, as though it were your last mass, as though it were your only mass. I, I had a very carefully planned out homily for that day, um, but I threw it out the window when I saw that quote. Uh, the Holy Spirit took over, and I made that the opening comment of my homily. I, I read that quote back, and I said, today is my first Mass. I hope to never forget this moment. Uh, I would say the best way we can celebrate Corpus Christi is to say, child of God, receive the Eucharist today as though it were your first Eucharist, as though it were your last Eucharist, as though it were your only Eucharist. If we can keep that link, uh, renew that covenant, remind ourselves that in that moment we're united with one another and uh, that we walk away reconciled and full of gratitude. We are much closer to experiencing the power that God wants to communicate to us through this most precious sacrament, the source and summit of our faith. I hope you have a blessed Corpus Christi. God bless you and we see you next week.